what are daily habits to boost your energy levels and allow you to live a longer, healthier life. Gary Brecka is the co-founder and chief human biologist at 10X Health, who has helped thousands of people implement the right routines to optimize their biology. Welcome to the Best You Podcast, where we help you explore how to improve all six areas of life, health, personal, career, financial, spiritual, and relational. My name is Nick Carrier, an entrepreneur, fitness trainer, and motivational speaker. I was going down the traditional path of working a nine to five until my mentor saw something in me. I quit my job and started my own business. My mission is to help you gain clarity on how to become your best you. Gary Breckett is a world-renowned biologist who is going to help us design a daily and weekly routine to make you live as long and as healthy as you want to. When you know biohacking techniques and health habits that bring you more energy and release stress about your personal health, then you can become unstoppable. Let's dive into optimizing your health and getting closer to your best you with the one and only Gary Brecka. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super excited to be joined by the one and only Gary Brecka. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to talk to Gary today about so many different things. I mean, he's one of the top human biologists in the world, and he's going to teach us today about how to live more vibrant, more energetic, longer lives. And so we're going to talk about habits and, and human optimization a lot today. And so Gary's joining us from his beautiful place out in Colorado, and if you guys are watching this on YouTube, just an amazing background. He just walked me around a little bit. There's so many different tools that he uses to further optimize his own biology and his own potential, and we'll get into some of those stuff today. But Gary, I want to start off kind of back to the basics like we had kind of talked about. Um, What are some foundational healthy habits that people like on a daily basis and on a weekly basis need to be going to? And, And we'll start off kind of big picture and then we can dive into some more of like the nitty gritty like protocol stuff afterwards as well but I just want to start high level what are some healthy habits that people need to be doing on a daily and healthy basis to be more energetic and set themselves up for a longer healthier life yeah sure um you know it's interesting um you know as I travel the world and I meet some of the top PhDs and clinical researchers and MDs in the space of longevity anti-aging you know bio-optimization it's it's astounding to me how um all of this research has come full circle and it's all getting back to the basics. You know, it reminds me of, I, I had a 22 year career as a mortality expert for uh, the life insurance industry, which meant that if I got 10 years of medical records on you and 10 years of demographic data, we could tell the insurance company how long you had to live uh, to the month. And the fascinating thing about what was limiting people from living longer, healthier, happier lives Um were what we called modifiable risk factors. Um, And they were a category of two things, changes that they could make to their lifestyle, um, their diet, their daily habits, or changes to make what they could make to how they were taking prescription medication or supplementation. And it would have had a demonstrative effect on the number of years they had left on earth, but more importantly, on their health span. And what I mean about things getting back to the basics is, you know, it can be very scary place uh, to get out on uh, Instagram or TikTok right now and and listen to health advice from qualified people because, you know, one's telling you vegetables are going to kill you. One's telling you meat's going to kill you. One's telling you that, um, you know, your supplementation is full of, you know, heavy metals. And another one's telling you if you drink tap water, you're going to die. Um, so the truth is that, you know, when when we look at what really creates optimal human beings, it's it really is the basics. I mean, God gave us everything that we need to thrive. And aging is just the aggressive pursuit of comfort. You know, we so aggressively pursue comfort that we accelerate our aging. And so, you know, three basics that we've gotten way far away from in humanity and mankind just because of the nature of how we live are the three biggest things that we get from Mother Nature. You know, right outside this door, you you get three benefits. You get magnetism from the earth, you get oxygen from the air, and you get light from the sun. You know, we were really meant to spend more than 85% of our time outdoors, and we spend more than 95% of our time indoors. And so, um, you know, when when we see what do we actually get from Mother Earth, well, first we get magnetism from the Earth. Think about the last time that you had bare feet touching bare soil. I mean, like dirt, grass, sand. That was the last time that you discharged 
into the earth. You know, the, the earth is a, is a grounding force and earthing and grounding is a very real thing and it will cost you absolutely zero. You know, I sell a $5,000 PEMF mat. In fact, I just got off of it. Um, and you could spend five grand on a PEMF mat and put this sophisticated device in your bed and mimic the, the, the earth's, um, low gauss current. Or you could take your shoes off and you could touch the surface of the earth because we know that the pH range of the body is very narrow. And, but the closer we are to the alkaline range, the less hospitable we are to disease and pathologies of all kinds. You may have heard cancer cannot survive in an alkaline environment. So it makes us alkaline. Well, it's certainly not drinking alkaline water, right? That was the biggest marketing myth ever sold to the public. Um, you know, you cannot change the pH of the body by putting alkaline water, um, through first pass metabolism, but you can change the pH, the potential hydrogen, the charge in the body by contacting the surface of the earth. And so what happens when you earth or you ground is you instantly change the, um, the low gauss current in the body. And what happens is cells all throughout your, your system, especially your red blood cells, go from being attracted to each other and sticking together to being repelled from one another and free floating. And just like taking a, a, a roll of quarters and looking at the surface area and then taking that roll of quarters and throwing it on the ground, and when it splatters open, look at the increase in surface area, all those surfaces from those quarters. The same thing happens in the bloodstream. When cells coagulate, and I'm not talking about a blood clot, I'm talking about just clump up because they're, they have opposing charges, then we lose all that surface area to exchange with the outside environment, eliminate waste, repair, detoxify, and regenerate. So by contacting the surface of the earth or using a PMF mat, this would be my first step, six to 15 minutes a day. That's it. Um, just contacting the surface of the earth. And then the second is oxygen, right? I use something called a hypermax oxygen system. Um, also costs five grand. You could get the same benefit by learning how to do um, breath work. Um, there is an eight minute breath work routine that I do every morning like clockwork. Um, I'm so committed to it. I haven't missed once in 38 straight months. Um, I would miss a commercial flight to not miss breath work um, because, you know, the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. You know, if I was to boil my entire 22 year career down in the life settlement, I mean, in the uh, life insurance space, the mortality space, it would be that statement. The presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. I defy anyone to find a single disease etiological pathway from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's to dementia to type 2 diabetes to psychiatric disorders that do not have their roots in a deficiency of blood oxygen or are not exacerbated by deficiency in blood oxygen. So it takes eight minutes. You know, I do uh, three rounds of 30 breaths. I didn't invent the breath work. It's a Wim Hof uh, style of breath work. He's the father of breath work. Um, in fact, there's a fascinating documentary on Netflix called The Iceman. If you ever really want to see the true power of learning to change the oxygen tension in your tissues. But if I told you that you, you had, that there was a, um, you know, a pill that in eight minutes could elevate your mood, improve your emotional state, rid the body of waste and toxins, increase your energy, improve red blood cell concentration, improve the, um, the motility in the digestive tract. Um, and then it would last seven to nine hours. You'd be like, that's amazing. That's exactly what breath work offers us. So I do three rounds of 30 really deep, intense breaths. And on my, on my 30th exhale, I hold my breath as long as I can. Remember that contrary to popular belief, nitric oxide is not the main vasodilator in the body. Carbon dioxide is. In fact, nitric, uh, nitric oxide and all the nitric oxide supplements are absolutely terrible for you. They actually destroy your mitochondria. But, um, but if I can, put a voluminous amount of oxygen into my bloodstream and then exhale and allow carbon dioxide to build up. I will not only get a very positive vasodilation, but all those cells begin to scream for oxygen. When you restart your breath work, that oxygen leaves the blood and enters the tissues. It's called the change in oxygen tension. You get lightheaded. That's a great sign. Your fingers and toes tingle. That's a great sign. Um, and I would start at five or 10 breaths and work my way up to three rounds of 30 breaths. And then the last thing is light. Um, 
again, I manufacture a red light therapy bed. I'd love to sell all your listeners a red light therapy bed. Um, the truth is that'll set you back $120,000 or you can go right outside for zero. Take your shirt off if you're a woman, just a sports bra and, and shorts. And when you're doing your breath work, expose your body to natural sunlight. You know, the safest time to do this is the first 45 minutes of the day. We call it first light. There's a voluminous amount of healthy blue light, not the blue light like you get from your screen and your phone. Um, there's no UVA or UVB damaging rays to age the skin. But interestingly, the wavelengths of light that pass through the skin and help the body convert cholesterol into vitamin D3, the single most important nutrient in the human body, those um, are, are readily prevalent in first light. So if I was to say, I don't have a penny to spend on biohacking and I want to do most that I could do to permanently change the trajectory of my life, I would do grounding, breath work, and expose my skin to first light in the morning. And those three things. And then you can add to that um, a, a cold shower. You know, we're, we're only now really to beginning to understand the benefits of cold water immersion. Yes, if you can afford a cold plunge, I sell those too. Uh, if you can afford a cold plunge, buy a cold plunge. But if not, you're going to take a shower. Um, so when your shower's done and you've lathered up and soaked off, step back out of the shower, turn it as cold as it will go, let it run for about 30 seconds and take a deep breath and then step into that ice cold stream and just deal with it. Deal with it for one to three minutes. You'll survive. Um, because we know now that when we shock the body with, um, dra dramatic changes in temperature and, and, and water is 29 times more thermogenic than air, meaning it removes heat from the body at 29 times the rate of air. So it causes a panic in, in a sense. Your liver panics and it floods the bloodstream with something called cold shock proteins, reserve proteins in your liver that will scour the body of free radical oxidation. It will quadruple the rate of protein synthesis, which is muscle repair. Um, it elevates your mood and improves your emotional state, causes a peripheral vasoconstriction, which drives blood to the brain, to the liver, lungs, pancreas, and the kidneys. And it also activates something called brown fat, which is our thermostat that can increase our metabolic rate. And all of these things are readily accessible. But the majority of your listeners will not put this to work in their life, number one, because they're too simple, and number two, because they're uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Most people won't do it just because number one, it's too simple. Um, you know, it's not, it's not shrouded in, in biohacking theory and complex complexity. Um, and number two, because it's uncomfortable. And, and this is where I coined the term aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. You know, we, we, re, we know now that sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality, right? Sitting is the new smoking. And, um, and there's a process in the human body called hormesis. Hormesis is where you stress the body and it strengthens in response. Not all stress is bad for the body. We got to stop telling grandma not to go outside. It's too hot, not to go outside. It's too cold, just to lay down, just to relax, to eat at the very first pang of hunger. Um, because this is collapsing all of our natural um, defense mechanisms and longevity mechanisms. We know if you don't load a bone, it won't strengthen. If you don't tear a muscle, it, it won't grow. And if you don't challenge the immune system, it weakens. You're seeing this coming out of the pandemic. The worst thing to ever happen to humanity, and I'll probably lose half the listeners because saying this, is, you know, was masking, residential quarantining, and, and social distancing. Um, because you're taking human beings out of what we were designed to do, which is interact with other human beings and combat these mm -hmm. pathogens. So what happens is you caused a progressive weakening of the immune system. And then when we pop the top on the pandemic, we wonder why we're hearing about all kinds of strange viruses, monkeypox, all this nonsense. I'm like, what the hell is monkeypox? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're on our eighth variant of Omicron now. Um, the reason why these variants are so prolific is because we, globally re weaken the immune system mm. man these are these are so good and i love how it is truly back to the basics with some of the stuff and like you said it's so nice because all of this is can be zero cost or you can go with uh with the more expensive stuff um you talked about with the you know you talked about magnetism changing the ph of the body by contacting the surface of the earth for maybe six to 15 minutes a day then you talked about breath work your eight minute routine is there reasonings behind those durations of six to 15 minutes a day and eight minute routine in the sense that like, if you do it for that period of time, you're going to 
feel the benefits of it for the remainder of the day? Like, does the six to 15 minutes and eight minute breathing routine provide the body biologically with the benefits for like that 24 hour period? And then you need to do it again. Grounding the last 24 to 48 hours. Um, yeah. So that, so for the surface cell polarity to change again, remember pH stands for potential hydrogen. It's a charge, right? So if you want to change the charge in the body, you run a low Gauss current or charge through the body. And you can do this by contacting the surface of the earth, right? Um, in fact, there's a, I just did a post on um, my Instagram um, to prove this. And I held the positive post of um, a voltage meter, a very sensitive voltage meter. And I plugged the negative pole into the ground. And I was standing on top of my running shoes. And I was holding the pole and it was in the ground. And you could see that the, um, um, that it was just resting on the post. As soon as I stepped off my shoes and stepped onto the ground, you could see it jump. So wow. you could actually see that I was completing that circuit, which means that I was discharging into the earth. And so, um, and this is very true. It's why we ground electricity into the earth. It's the reason why lightning, you know, strikes, uh, strikes the earth to be grounded. And, um, and, and, you know, with two and a half inch, you know, rubber soles and leather soles and, and car tires and tile floors and wood floors. We're just not, we're insulated from, from mother earth. Wow. That's awesome. That's, that's powerful. Um, I, I love stuff like this so much. And, and I, I kind of want to stay on some different topics like this that are outside of may, maybe just fitness and nutrition, because we talk a lot about fitness and nutrition on this podcast. We might be able to dive into that stuff a little bit, but the next thing I want to kind of dive into is blood work. And in, and in particular, the, the numbers that are, talked about a lot like cholesterol levels and like triglyceride levels and st and things like that and I want to start right off with the cholesterol portion of it talk to us about what cholesterol is debunk any myths about it talk to us about LDL HDL and what people need to actually be concerned about not concerned about and how to maybe positively influence those numbers yeah so um so I, I believe that cholesterol is one of the most maligned and misunderstood compounds in the human body, right? So if we talk about what cholesterol is and what it's not, first of all, um, cholesterol is not a fuel source. Okay, so your body cannot use cholesterol for energy. You absorb virtually zero cholesterol from an egg, for example, um, through the lining of the gut. So the cholesterol in your bloodstream um, is not as highly linked to the cholesterol that you eat as you think. 85% of all the cholesterol in your blood um, is manufactured by the liver. So the first thing is, if it's not a fuel source and if it's manufactured by the liver, then what is it? Well, it's a construction material. We use cholesterol to build every cell wall, every cell membrane, every hormone in the human body, and we make it to make, we use it to make the single most important nutrient in the human body, which is vitamin D3. Remember, vitamin D3, which we make from sunlight and cholesterol, is the only vitamin that a human being can make. So just think about that for a second. How important must that nutrient be? It also acts like a hormone. Um, but how important must that hormone and vitamin be if it's the only one that human beings make on our own? There's hundreds of bloodstream right now. You are only capable of making one. So cholesterol is used for all of these things. Where cholesterol gets... Uh, you know, blamed for is that cholesterol um, is very often at the scene of the crime, but it does not pull the trigger. So in other words, it's not the amount of LDL cholesterol in your blood that matters. It is two things, the size of the cholesterol molecule, and it is whether or not um, that cholesterol molecule is um, in the presence of what we call PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, seed oils mainly, which essentially make the cholesterol rancid. And it is this type of rancid cholesterol that causes placking, coagulation, athlero, arteriosclerotic placking, and all of the contributions to cardiovascular disease. So first of all, what makes cholesterol large or small? Well, remember that Cholesterol is like a tennis ball. And if cholesterol was a tennis ball, the surface, the, the fuzzy yellow surface of cholesterol would be a triglyceride. It's the fat in your blood. So blood fat is transported around the bloodstream on the surface of cholesterol. So let's say that your amount of cholesterol stays stable. 
but you increase the amount of blood fat. What's going to happen is the cholesterol molecule is going to get smaller. Not to get too hyper scientific on you, but if you went back to high school geometry and you remember that as the size of a sphere gets smaller, its surface area to volume ratio goes up. So in other words, a basketball has less surface area to volume ratio than a golf ball. So let's say you had two basketballs sitting on your kitchen counter. This represents the cholesterol in your bloodstream. And you add more blood fat, more triglyceride. Well, if I keep adding more triglyceride, those two basketballs are going to become four baseball or softballs. And if I keep adding triglyceride, they're going to become eight baseballs. And then they're going to become 16 golf balls. And then they're going to become 32 little BBs. Do you notice I never changed the volume of cholesterol, mm -hmm. changed the size to accommodate the increased triglyceride fat. If you look at the peer-reviewed published clinical literature on LDL cholesterol, you will find virtually zero evidence linking elevated levels of LDL cholesterol on its own to cardiovascular disease. So what raises blood fat, triglyceride, sugar? People that eat the most sugar have the highest blood fat. So the long and short of it is, if you remove processed sugars and a refined carbohydrates from your diet, you bring your glycemic profile down, you will see your cholesterol improve because your triglycerides will improve. Remember, when we eat sugar, glucose rises in the blood. Insulin rises to bring sugar down. The primary role of insulin is not to lower blood sugar. The primary role of insulin is to block any other form of energy use in the body. So this means if I have high insulin, I cannot burn fat. If I cannot burn fat, the first place fat shows up is in the blood. When it shows up in the blood, it decreases the size of cholesterol. When it decreases the size of cholesterol, it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. So if you want to dramatically lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, eliminate processed foods, refined carbohydrates, and sugars from your diet. Um, mm. you know, I'm trying to change the Bible right now from the love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> Sugar is the root of all evil. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, um, I'm having no luck, but you know, <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're making a dent. That's for sure. Um, that was, that was awesome. And I think that was a very clear description. I feel like I have a whole lot better of a grasp of it. And I feel like everybody else probably has a whole lot better of a grasp of it as well. I loved the analogy of the basketball to softball to baseball to golf ball to BBs. I think that's great uh, to kind of just retouch on it with regards to how to ensure that these numbers are where they're supposed to be. It's it's mainly about making sure triglycerides are on the, are on the lower side of things. You want to have triglycerides below 150. Okay. okay. Preferably between 75 and 125. Um, you'll get this on a lipid panel. Um, you want to have your HDL, your high density lipoprotein, which is your healthy cholesterol, above 39, preferably above 50. Um, and you want LDL cholesterol between 100 and 220. Um, if it's over 99, your doctor's going to tell you it's elevated and you need to go on a stat. Um, and that would be an absolute crime because, you know, one of the things that we studied in the mortality space in that my 22 year career was what was the impact on all cause mortality from some of these different medications that people are on thyroid medications, antidepressants, um, um, blood pressure medications, corticosteroids, statins, these sorts of things. And you're seeing this medicine is beginning to come full circle. Right. We know now that the serotonin theory of depression has been completely debunked, even though there are tens of millions of people on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that may permanently cause a tachyphylactic response in your brain, meaning a desensitization response, quadrupling your um, the incidence of, of suicide and potentially leading to leading to crippling permanent depression. We know that when people take corticosteroids, which are, um, you know, uh, oral uh, not steroids for your muscles, but these are these are steroids to reduce inflammation. Um, uh, you know, prednisone steroids like this. We know that initially they're anti-inflammatory, but then they begin to eat the joint like a termite. 
Like I knew in the mortality space that if you were diagnosed with something like rheumatoid arthritis and put on a corticosteroid, you had six years and one day until you were having a joint replacement. It was so accurate that if you were a 60 year old male or female, I would artificially advance your age six years and one day and I would schedule the joint replacement. And then what I would do is I would begin to reduce something called your ambulatory profile, how well you ambulate, how well you move. And as I reduced your mobility, I could bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with reduced mobility. So I would bring your future from decades ahead right into your present. And you would eventually succumb to a disease that you never had because you were on a medication that wasn't required because you may have been diagnosed with a condition that didn't exist. And so, you know, one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we saw in the space that I used to work in, in the mortality space was something called iatrogenic illness, which is physician induced illness. Um, if you look at the 2016 Harvard university study or the 2019 um, Johns Hopkins study, you'll find that modern medicine, medical error is the third leading cause of death, right? So modern medicine kills more people than morbid obesity and diabetes combined. Only mm -hmm. cancer and cardiovascular disease kill pe more people than medical error. And so we're very good at crisis medicine. We're very poor at bio-optimization. Um, and that's why we got to take these things into our own hands. Yeah, no, this is this is great. Um, I appreciate you sharing the, those numbers with uh, the triglycerides and the HDL and LDL as well. So why, <clears throat> if somebody has numbers that they just heard the numbers and they just had blood work done and they're like, holy crap, I'm off on these things. So it's not about eating less cholesterol. It's about eating less, less sugar, less processed foods and less refined carbohydrates. No question. I mean, there is virtually zero correlation between dietary cholesterol intake and blood levels of cholesterol, virtually zero. Um, and so you could cut all of the cholesterol out of your diet entirely, and you will not move your LDL cholesterol, maybe marginally, but not, yeah. not any significance at all, less, less than 10%. But if you want to have a demonstrative move on, on cholesterol, then you bring down your glycemic profile, your, your, the three month average of your blood sugar, it's called hemoglobin A1C. You bring down your glycemic profile, meaning you actually lower the amount of sugar that you're taking into the body. Um, and, you know, you can do this with any form of diet, carnivore, keto, paleo, raw food, vegan, vegetarian, you know, the, 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 the dietary myths that are out there that you have to be all keto or all carnivore or all vegan or all raw or all vegetarian, they negate the most important point, And that is the the caliber, the quality of the whole food. You see, our food supply is not so much about the food that we eat. It's about the distance from the from the um, seed to the table, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just did a huge post about, uh, um, you know, the, ne the, the negativity, of, you know, of uh, seed oils, the toxicity in seed oils. And I didn't say that seed oils were bad for you. I said industrial processed seed oils were bad for you because, you know, we take a lot of things in modern agriculture that are non-toxic, that are actually very good for you, like grass-fed meat, and between the cattle and the table, and this is what, you know, the challenge happens here, you know, between glyphosates that they're spraying onto the grass that the cattle's eating, to the um, what they're doing um, when they feed them corn syrups and, and soy, uh, which is very unnatural. In fact, I was walking through the woods here in Colorado with my wife a few, few days ago, and I found a decomposed um, uh, elk uh, skeleton. And I picked up the skull and I turned it over and I asked my wife, I said, do you notice anything special about this skeleton? She goes, no. I said, notice that he has all of his teeth and none of the teeth, a single cavity. There's no rot. You could tell there was no gum disease. This was a very, very, very healthy animal because he's out here eating what he's supposed to eat. If you looked at the skull of a commercially raised cattle, you would find all of the teeth have rotted up into the gum and into the bone. They have no teeth left. They have type 2 diabetes by the time they're slaughtered. They cannot chew cud anymore, so they actually feed them a combination of um, uh, corn syrup and, and soy, and they have to actually just slurp it. They're so close to dying of diabetes, it's one of the calculations that they use to determine the slaughter timing. And so, but if you took that same cattle and put it in a grass field like this, and it had grass and worms and bugs and dew color, uh, covered grass and flowers, 
Um, you find the omega-3, omega-6 ratio changes in the fat. There's no, there's no pus and hormones in the fat. There's no vaccines in the fat. Um, and really focus on whole food sources. Super important. Yeah. I think I love how you acknowledge the fact that a lot of these diets can work for a lot of different people. I mean, I think it's hilarious when people try to completely demonize one habit or one diet when there's thousands of people who are doing it and probably seeing pretty good benefits and people will demonize the other side and say that that's going to kill you when there's a thousand people doing it, millions of people doing it and they're, and they're doing just fine. Like you said, the through line on if you're doing all of them the right way is you're eating real foods and you're making it as close to the source. Yeah. Exactly. You're eating whole foods. I mean, you know, th- th- that was my argument with seed oils. I said, look, when you take a canola plant and you put it in a commercial press and it comes out gummy, Right. And now you degum it with hexane, which is a known neurotoxin. And now you have a degummed neurotoxic oil. And then you heat it to 405 degrees and you make this degummed neurotoxic oil rancid. And then it begins to stink. So you odorize it with sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a well known carcinogen. And then the oil's cloudy. So we bleach it with mild amounts of chlorine. So you have a sodium hydroxide hexanated. Um, um, chlorinated oil that's been heated to a rancid temperature. Now you put that on the shelf. One of the most yeah. toxic compounds you can put in the human body. But it didn't start that way. Right. right. And that's where the argument goes awry. It's the industrial processing. You know, it's it's the non-grass-fed raised cattle. It's the glyphosate-laden fields. I mean, one of the other worst things you can put in the human body are GMO foods. Mm. You know, Italy and Russia have banned these foods. The EU is looking to potentially ban these foods. In Russia, it is a felony to grow genetically modified crops. Yeah. You go to Brazil. Um, yeah. Here, it's the fastest growing area of agriculture. And we genetically modified seeds to make them resistant to glyphosate, which is a um, uh, insecticide, a poison. And um, I mean, an herbicide, a poison. And so the seed is resistant to glyphosate, but when you genetically modify it, there's hordes of evidence now that that genetically modified plant is not only non-digestible, but it also can potentially alter the epigenome in a human being. Mm. These are unnatural foods. Um, wow. it, we also just outlawed uh, lab-grown meat. It was the first country in the world to do that. Um, wow. You know, the, the United States is one of the few civilized nations in the world that uses something called single-dose toxicity to determine whether or not something's poisonous for you. So I'm actually legally allowed to poison you in small doses um, as long as the dose is not enough to cause a physiologic effect. This is why a lot of our energy drinks and our supplements have something called cyanocobalamin. You want to throw those things in the trash. That is a cyanide-based B12. We make that B12 from hydrogen cyanide, a chemical weapon, and the cobalt metal. In small doses, it's harmless. In cumulative doses, it can be toxic, just like mercury. Nobody got mercury poisoning from eating one piece of tuna fish. Right. It's the cumulative dose toxicity not the single dose toxicity that matters. And so when we have an entire industrial complex like the FDA that's based on single dose toxicity, and it says, Mm. this is safe for you, Nick, because this dose will not harm you, but those dosages are cumulative so that over time you create toxicity. Um, You know, one of the things I built this whole retreat out here is to get get away from that. Yeah, that's that's profound. I never heard of that phrase, a single dose toxicity before. And that makes so much sense as to why we have so many different things off. Um, when you were talking about energy drinks, I think the the ingredient that you were going to say to make sure to avoid, I, we got cut off really quickly when you were saying that. What what are the, and if you're looking at energy drinks and stuff like that, what is the what thing you want to make sure you're not having? It's called cyanocobalamin. Um, okay. I'm going to show you something, uh, because nobody believes me when I say this. So I'm actually just going to take you to the national library of medicine at the national Institute of health. Can I share my screen for a second? Yeah. Let me see if I, uh, so for those that are listening, I'll, I'll talk my way through it. But for those of you that are watching, you, you know, you can just, um, see this firsthand. Um, but let's go to, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to put in cyanocobalamin, which is the most common form of B12 in the world. We make it in a laboratory. It does not occur anywhere naturally in nature. Three other forms of B12 occur naturally in nature, the most beneficial of which is called methylcobalamin. Um, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the National Library of Medicine 
You see this at the National Institute of Health. And I'm just going to look up this form of B12. So I'm going to say, um, if I wanted to source this form of B12, let's say, and put it in a multivitamin, here's where I'd go. And I scroll down here to section 5.3, and it will tell me it's component compounds. See this right here where it says component compounds? Yep. Okay, well, it's made from the cobalt metal, which all B12 is, and it's also made from something called a cyano radical. Well, what's that? Well, that's hydrogen cyanide. That is a flammable, acute toxic, health hazard, environmental hazard. Um, I wonder what else they um, use this in. Oh, here you go. It is a, these are not my words. Hydrogen cyanide is a highly toxic conjugate acid of cyanide that is used as a chemical weapon agent. We use it exactly that to make a cyanide-based form of B12 synthetically in a lab, and we sell it cheaply to the public, and we are allowed to do it because we use the basis of single-dose toxicity to slowly poison um, the public. Wow. Now, you could take an energy drink that had methylcobalamin or a, a supplement that had methylcobalamin or what's called hydroxycobalamin and be fine. Um but the truth is this single dose toxicity is terrible. The same thing's happening with fluoride. You know, I, I, I just did a huge expose on fluoride and, um, you know, one of the national toxicity foundations, um, actually sued the federal government and got the data on fluoride. It was just released in March of this year. They found zero safe levels in drinking water. In fact, if you want to make a real material change on the trajectory of your health, make today the day that you never drink tap water again. And I'm not saying you have to buy expensive bottled water or super expensive um, water filter. Go online and find a water filter. They might be as cheap as 16 or 20 bucks. Make sure that at a minimum that it filters fluoride and chlorine out of the water. In 3,600 municipalities across the United States, Without a single exception, they found an inverse relationship between a higher amount of fluoride and a decrease in IQ. Mm. As fluoride goes up, IQ goes down. And shame on the dentists that promulgated this because they extrapolated a study from the from the mid or from the early 1990s that showed that fluoride could create a micro nanoparticulate layer over the enamel of the tooth, and if you laid sugar on top of it, it would not um erode the enamel well i mean so would candle wax but and then we extrapolated that really shoddy study into fluoride toothpaste and fluoride in your drinking water and fluoride in uh you know treatments for dental hygiene and there's zero implications for fluoride in in um, the prevention of dental uh, decay and it has serious systemic neurotoxic effects in the human body wow man that's so good. You're giving us so many good things here. Do you have about 10 more minutes with me? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, I would be, we have a lot of fitness uh, enthusiasts on this podcast. And so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you something about fitness. Talk to me about, I know you're big into fitness. You showed me outside with your, your bike and the different things, some, some of the different things that you do. Talk to me about from a more of like a longevity standpoint and a health span perspective of being able to, live in a manner that we're independent and we and we don't rely on other people to do different things and from a longevity and health span perspective with regards to our cardiovascular health what are some of the different things from a fitness perspective that we really get a lot of bang for our buck from when it comes to our fitness routines well there's no no question that the most significant is weight training um you know, weight training beats cardiovascular training, hands down, in every published peer-reviewed human clinical trial that study that I've ever read. Um, if you don't think you can get a good cardiovascular workout when you're weight training, you're not, you know, weight training properly. Anybody that is, um, you know, remotely familiar with, you know, the pace of, uh, you know, keeping up a, a certain pace when you're weight training knows that you can keep your heart rate really elevated and you can also get cardiovascular benefits. Um, I also sit on the board of the, you know, NFL alumni. We have 22,000 members in our, um, in our, uh, organization. And so, you know, post, um, 
um, professional years in, in, in the league is where we really take over and help them maintain that level of fitness for the balance of their lifetime. We know now that muscle is our metabolic currency. Muscle, in my opinion, is the largest organ in the body. I don't believe that it's the skin because muscle is our repository. It's the sponge for glucose. We absorb sugar into our muscles in the form of something called glycogen. It also stabilizes our skeleton. It secretes endorphins. It raises our metabolic rate. It decreases the incidence of um, all-cause cardiovascular disease. We know now that age-related muscle wasting, which is called sarcopenia, leads to frailty. And frailty is one of the highest risks of early mortality. And so, and, and, you know, if you're in your twenties or your thirties or your forties right now, and you think that that's far off, it actually begins now. And so, um, if you want to live a long time, lift heavy weight, and I'm not saying to go in and back squat and go to CrossFit and do complicated compound Olympic moves, but, um, grip strength is related to longevity. I mean, for, uh, most men, they should actually be able to do a dead hang for two minutes. Um, you should be able to single step your, um, you should be able to put your leg at 90 degrees on a box jump and slowly single step your, your self up and slowly single step your foot down. A lot of people can't do that. Balance is another one where you close your eyes and extend your foot. Um, the closer to 10 seconds, the worse that, um, uh, core balance is the closer to 30 seconds, the, the better it is. And remember in weight training and muscle training, um, if you boil all the research down to kind of one concept, it's, it's that, um, you know, the last rep really matters, right? It's how much muscle have we torn and to tear a muscle through its full physiologic range seems to be the best way to create muscle hyper hypertrophy and muscle hyperplasia. Meaning at some point, um, a drop set to failure for each of your body parts. So if you're doing bench, it's fine to bench heavy and do a chest routine. At the end of that chest routine, start with a heavy weight. You can do six times to failure and try to increase to 10 and 12 times to failure, dropping the weight. Tear the muscle through its full physiologic range. And, um, you know, I'm oversimplifying a lot, a lot of science there, but, um, and then cardiovascular training is excellent too. Um, uh, I just read Dr. Atia's book. You know, he's a huge fan of rucking, which I'm also a huge fan of. Um, I think that's a great book, by the way, if you're in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, and, you're, and you're looking to live a long, happy, healthy lifetime. He talks about preparing for something he calls the uh, uh, the centenarian decathlon, which is like 10 things you want to be able to do when you're 100 years old. And yeah. how much weight do you need to be able to lift on your 35th birthday if you want to be able to um, do those things on your hundredth birthday. Um, you know, interestingly, the, the, the centenarian that broke the world cycling record on his hundredth birthday just came back and broke it three years later on his 103rd birthday. So you can actually improve your cardiovascular and your, um, physical conditioning. It's never too late to improve those throughout your lifetime. Yeah. Is that if you really want to get serious about biohacking, I mean, breath work, grounding, um, cold showers, uh, whole foods, getting fluorides out of your, um, water. No, all these things will cost you nothing. Um, you know, getting a inexpensive water filter to get fluoride out, avoiding GMO foods. You know, these are things that you can do by, by just being conscious. If you really want to go next level, you have to get data on your body, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing that we don't measure is, is changeable. And, you know, most young entrepreneurs know more about their business than they do about their bodies. It's astounding to me. You know, my partner's Grant Cardone. He's a real estate billionaire. Um, you know, he hosts seminars all, all over the country. He's, he's an absolute beast. Um, he, he actually does not look, act, or perform like a 65-year-old man. Um, he looks like a 40-year-old man. He thinks and acts like a 25-year-old man. He's got the energy of a teenager. And um, and this isn't by accident. You know, we've we've designed it. But but when I talk to most entrepreneurs, they know more about their income statement, their balance sheet, and their, and their P&L than they know about their own biome. Like, this is your temple. If you get data on this, then you can optimize it. Most of us are walking around right now at about 60% of our true state of normal. If you're listening to this and you think that you're optimal, you, you very well may be 60% of the way there. You have no idea how good normal could feel. And when you, you know, my suggestion is that you... There's two tests that I believe that people should do. One, 
is an absolute must and you have to do it once in your lifetime. And it's a genetic test. It's called a methylation test. You do not have to do the test through me. Google it. There's tons of companies that do it. Um, um, you know, we also have to do a genetic test, but you do a cheek swab, you send it to a lab and it tells you exactly what raw materials, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, nutrients, your body cannot convert into the usable form. And it is this deficiency that is holding you back from being optimal. It's interrupting your, it's creating brain fog. It's interrupting your focus, your concentration, your delta wave of sleep, your response to exercise, your waking energy, your short-term recall, all these little things that are nipping at you, anxiousness, anxiety, um, ADD, ADHD. And so to become more mentally fit, we need data. And once you do this test once in your lifetime, you'll never guess on what you need to supplement with. Most wow. people are just supplementing for the sake of supplementing instead of supplementing for deficiency. You want to see magic happen in the human body? Start supplementing for what your body's deficient in and get out of its way. It is astounding what can happen. That's great. What, uh, so you said genetic testing. Was there another test that you were going to mention? I got you. The second is a blood test. And you want to ask your doctor to look at three things. Okay, What's called glycemic control. How well are you controlling your blood sugar? Glucose, hemoglobin A1C, insulin, a hormone panel, full hormone panel on males and females, and nutrient deficiencies, specifically vitamin D3, which is called um, vitamin D25 hydroxy on a blood test, um, and B12. And this is the basics of where you start. This is the casting net that you throw out to decide where is my baseline. And you can get your blood work done once a year, maybe twice a year. Look at your hormone balance because most people that qualify for hormone therapy actually don't need hormones. They need raw materials that their body uses to make hormones. So for example, if you're clinically deficient in vitamin D3 and clinically deficient in DHEA, you will be low on testosterone. And you don't need testosterone injections. You need to give your body back the raw material it needs to make testosterone. Because the primary role of testosterone, contrary to popular belief, is not male characteristics. It's not deep voice, facial hair, aggression, muscles. Um, it's none of those things. The primary role of testosterone is called erythropoiesis, to put pressure on the bone marrow to create new red blood cells. And when you have healthy red blood cells in the bloodstream in the right amount, your energy level is through the roof. People that are low on testosterone are generally low on red blood cell and hemoglobin. And this is why they're tired. And this is why they have brain fog. And this is why they don't sleep. And you might not need hormone therapy. You might simply need D3 and DHEA to give your body the raw material to make that hormone. And that's a fascinating thing about the human body. Magic things happen when we just give it the raw material it needs to do its job. Mm. Man, that's so good. That's so good. Uh, so many different great things here, you guys. You guys, if you, if you don't follow Gary on Instagram yet, get to following Gary on Instagram at Gary Brecca. We'll have all this stuff linked up in the show notes. Uh, if you want to go get that genetic testing, they do genetic testing with 10X. You can go to 10XYourHealth.com and learn more about that if you're interested on taking it to the next level. Uh, any other good place that people should go learn more about you and, and what you're up to besides those places? It's it's 10XHealthTest.com, but... Um, okay. Um, all I do is teach on Instagram. So, you know, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into these, you know, all I do is, is teach on Instagram, all, all my podcasts, including this one will eventually be available there on my, um, link tree. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarking on a project that I call the ultimate human, um, which is a combination of a podcast that will eventually lead into a place where people can go to find all things ultimate human. They won't be my products, but my team will clinically and critically evaluate them. So if you wanted to know what are the best cleaning products for my house that, um, what are the best lotions for my skin? What are the best, you know, hair care products? What kind of water should I be drinking? You know, I want to really give a platform to companies that are doing things right, that are creating, you know, metal free chocolates and seed oil free, um, um, foods and, and just give them a platform so people can easily find them. Beautiful. That's awesome. Well, I'm I'm super excited for that to come out, y'all. There were so many good things 
here today that Gary talked to that we can start to change in our daily and our weekly habits, like magnetism, getting out and do grounding work just six to 15 minutes a day, breath work, sunlight, cold showers, getting those different genetic testings done and, and ensure that we're staying close to the source with our foods, staying as minimally processed as absolutely possible. Um, Gary, so many different great things today. You provided a lot of value for everybody, and I know that uh, people are going to start to take action on a lot of this stuff on a daily and weekly basis because they can do simple things and they can do things that are a little bit uncomfortable. I know you guys can. Uh, Gary, that's all we got today. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too, man. Thank you so much for having me on. 